are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Nobody was to know at the time, but this scene, this scene right here, would go on to change the history of modern movie making across the world. If yeah, not really. <laughs> Hello once again and welcome to another awkward, stilted, and incomprehensible episode of What Happened, the show that was literally made to discuss the 2003 motion picture, The Room. And I finally got around to doing it! <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> You must be kidding, aren't you? What was once a dark little secret nestled deep into Hollywood's bosom exploded into a cult film phenomenon the likes of which we won't see again for a long, long time. But its origins are just as bizarre as the movie itself. It's a baffling tale that involves mysterious mountains of money, most of it wasted, lots of hirings, firings, and an agonizing stretch of production that pushed many to their breaking points. So grab a slice of pizza, your spoon of choice, and your least embarrassing underwears. It's time to find out what happened with The Room. You obviously can't discuss this monumental milestone of movie magic without talking about its enigmatic writer slash director slash mad scientist Tommy Wiseau, a man of cloudy origins and even cloudier financial backing. He and fellow Hollywood hopeful Greg Sestero met in an acting class in San Francisco, and despite Tommy's bizarre behavior, cadence, and acting <coughs> ability, Greg nevertheless felt drawn to Tommy, feeling he was very much an underdog just like himself. After they struck up a friendship, they both then moved to Los Angeles to make their shared dream of Tinseltown success a reality. While Greg hit the streets, passing around headshots and auditioning for any role he could, Tommy took a different tact. Knowing it would be unlikely he would ever get cast in the type of roles he wanted, the leading man, he opted to weave his own story and get that made, come hell or high water. The room would focus on a bank employee named Johnny, his wife Lisa, and their tumultuous, confusing relationship. It would also feature drug deals, birthday parties, playing catch, trying on tuxes, atomic bombs, playing catch, weed-powered rages, and finally, playing catch. Tommy first envisioned the story as a play and wrote it as such, which is why there's so few locations, as it all primarily takes place in Tommy, I, I mean Johnny's apartment. Perhaps not knowing how to actually get a live play off the ground, he then decided to adapt the room into a 500 page novel. That's, that's 500 page suck it Tolkien! This original version encompassed a lot more really bizarre additional storylines that the movie thankfully or unthankfully, depending on who you talk to, did not include. Once he had completed this magnum opus, Tommy sent out the manuscripts to various publishers, but, try to be shocked here, was rejected by each and every one. With this latest setback, Mr. Wiseau finally realized if he wanted to get this done, he would have to do it himself. Since he lived in LA, it would be technically possible to just hire a crew, rent a studio space and cameras, and to just film the room with him as director, which he would kinda need to do anyway, as all the movie studios he submitted his script to all enthusiastically said no. By the way, the usual waiting period for a script evaluation takes one to two weeks to determine if it could be tweaked or readapted into something else, etc. But like so many other things, the room managed yet another first. Its script was rejected in less than 24 hours. So with the traditional studio system very much out, Tommy would have to opt for more independent methods to get this thing made. Hell, some of the most beloved films of all time were made outside that studio system, so there's no reason why Tommy couldn't do the same. All it would cost is more money. Ah yes, the money. This is one aspect of the story that no one really has a definitive answer to, except for the man himself. 
The entirety of the room's budget was covered by our charismatic main character, and when questioned by Greg back then, or even if asked today, all Tommy would say is that he made his money through property investments and importing leather jackets from Korea, but always stopped short of ever actually offering proof of either. But the point was is that he had the money to burn, and in the grand scheme of things, it's really only Tommy's business of where it actually came from. With his mind set, Tommy then begged Greg to star in the film as Johnny's friend Mark, the good-natured but nevertheless traitorous character who would have multiple affairs with Lisa. D I, I mean, spoilers! Greg rebuffed these offers every single time until Tommy had worn him down enough to accept an off-camera line producer credit, however begrudgingly. Greg had already read Tommy's script, you see. Uh, he knew what was coming, but also figured it would never actually get filmed. Filming began in the summer of 2002. One of Tommy's favorite sayings was, Real Hollywood movie, no Mickey Mouse stuff which was him wanting to use top of the line, well, everything, even if he didn't understand what that meant. One of those things that he didn't understand was the difference between 35mm and HD digital film, so he decided to buy, not rent, but buy cameras that could shoot both. He explained to the crew that The Room would be the first movie to be shot on 35mm and HD simultaneously. Now, there's absolutely no reason to have done this as it was a colossal waste of money and time, but it was just something Tommy felt he had to do. So they would need two separate camera crews working at the same time and a special custom rig that would hook both cameras together so they could be used in tandem. This beast would require far more time to set up and operate before and after each shot, easily multiplying the time it would take to film literally anything. Oh, and one final note on this, the film's original edit was all done on the 35mm version anyway, thus making that HD camera a complete waste. <laughs> That's so Tommy. Oh, hi Mark. The casting process also didn't go smoothly, as dozens of desperate actors and actresses vying for any work they could get wound up answering the casting call. A good number of Tommy's first choices never actually lasted long enough to be featured in the final cut, as he fired them only a few days into filming. So they were replaced by their understudies, with Juliette Danielle filling the role of Lisa. Anything for my princess. <laughs> Mark was also going to be played by someone else, but again, Tommy fired him once production began. While there could be a good reason for this that we're not aware of, it still allowed Tommy to then put Greg in a difficult position. With cameras already rolling and having just lost a principal character, Tommy once again asked him to take on the role, and with no immediate jobs on the horizon and wanting to get this whole thing over with, Greg finally reluctantly agreed. Once the cast was locked in and filming began in earnest, the room needed to change, like, like, a, like a lot. As I hinted at before, the novel had 500 pages of befuddling content, and a good portion of that transferred over to the script, but would never actually be filmed. Most of these on-the-day revisions came from script supervisor Sandy Chaclair, whose job it was to make sense of Tommy's script. He would often edit dialogue or offer changes whenever Tommy was in a suggestible mood, which unfortunately wasn't a lot of the time. Sandy is often credited as the one who molded the room into something approaching a normal film, which, considering the end product... What kind of drugs do you take? It's nothing like that. What meant that you could only imagine the stuff left on the cutting room floor. The initial script had several unused subplots, but none more Wiseau-esque than it being revealed Johnny was a vampire and owned a flying car. But that wasn't all though. Throughout the movie's running time, you saw several characters appear and events transpire seemingly at random and often with little explanation. This is because of all the revisions and cuts that Sam 
Andy, Greg, and others were able to talk Tommy into. One other big change that wasn't due to any of that was the character of Peter, the psychologist, a satellite friend to Mark and Johnny who disappears from the film altogether. The actor, fed up with Wiseau's on-set behavior and obviously the material, All right, that's it, I'm done. declared he had another acting gig lined up, and if the room wasn't finished by then, he would simply walk off the set, which is exactly what he did. The movie never acknowledges his absence, so his lines are simply given to someone else, this magnificent bastard right here. I feel like I'm sitting on an atomic bomb waiting for it to go off. Me too. The filming dragged on and on, during which Tommy would apparently treat much of the cast and crew rather poorly, regularly admonishing them for their performances and forgetting to spring for things like water or cooling solutions during the sweltering LA summer. Most of the cast and crew had few other avenues for work at that time, and they needed Tommy to keep signing checks so they could just cover their rent. Staff retention on the room was probably lower than several major Hollywood pictures combined. Because while there were several walkouts, most on the crew just figured that the production would wrap soon enough. But unfortunately, that was not soon enough. While the HD 35mm camera unculus was bad enough in terms of a time sink, Tommy had several scenes shot twice, for no reason. Particular bits of the movie that took place on the roof were shot again months later in the alleyway set, despite them filming in a real alleyway earlier. Tommy had the crew construct this fake set for I, I don't know why, because it would have been so much cheaper and easier to just reuse the alley location from earlier. It's things like this that cause the production schedule to balloon out of control, both in terms of time, but especially in terms of money. How much exactly? Well, to the tune of about six million dollars. Can you name uh, another movie that costs that much? Well, I can. The Terminator! The Terminator! Greg Sestero recalled the last few weeks of filming being a particularly stressful and trying time between him and Tommy. Because while he knew Tommy as pleasant and generous in most situations, his personality degraded as the film wore on. To prep for the role, Tommy had lost a lot of weight and would regularly show up on shoot days hours behind schedule and under the influence of something. To get through most of these rougher days, he would down a combination of energy drinks and pills and would sometimes even break down into brief bouts of delirium. One of the most famous examples of this is when it took over three hours and 32 combined takes for the crew to shoot this mere seven seconds of film. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. So, yeah, Tommy kept messing up the lines, for, forgetting them all together, or would do things out of order. Just everything that could have gone wrong did. All things must come to an end though, and mercifully, so did the filming of The Room. And while it did wrap its principal photography by the end of the summer, Tommy, Greg, and a small crew still had to shoot a lot of B-roll for establishing shots, since the movie took place in San Francisco. They would drive back up to the city where the duo first met and stayed for several more weeks, capturing these timeless scenes that have since been burned into many a brain. Greg recalled in his book, The Disaster Artist, that during this trip, they wound up recording way more B-roll than they would ever need, and felt that this was Tommy simply not wanting this to end, that he was dragging out the process even further. Why? Well, it could be that Tommy was aware that the room was going to be an unintelligible mess, uh, that he had a fear of failure despite his outside bravado. Or he simply didn't want this movie-making magic carpet ride to ever end. The answer is probably all of the above. Once the B-roll was shot, Tommy and Greg barely spoke, as Greg wanted to put this whole ordeal behind him and to try to focus on his future as best he could. So Greg needed to play catch-up trying to get his career back on track, and had all but forgotten about the room for months, during which it was being stitched together like Frankenstein's monster in a dark editing room somewhere. 
eventually, Tommy finally reached out to Greg and said it was on. A theater was going to be showing the room and there would be a big red carpet premiere citation needed. Tommy even took out an ad on a notable Hollywood billboard, which due to everything about it convinced many onlookers that the room was some type of horror film. And while it wasn't, this image at least gave many children a hearty and lasting nightmare. Estimations for the price of this ad has varied, but this apparently cost Tommy about $5,000 a month and remained standing for five years. So that's like 5K, two, two months, or five years. See this carry the two. Uh, totaling a cool $300,000. As for its uh, theatrical run, the single theater Tommy could get to show it only did so for about a week, in which it accrued a whopping $1,900. The theater also took the opportunity to erect a sign that said, no refunds. In most circumstances, this is where this story should end. But in 2009, six years after its completion, Adult Swim played the room all day on loop as part of their April Fool's festivities, and it's really here where room awareness exploded. Comedians and other celebrities started endorsing it. People began holding viewing parties, and before you know it, Tommy's phone was ringing off the hook. His failed experiment had graduated to cult phenomenon. Leaning into where the winds were now blowing, Tommy also started to frame the room as a dark comedy, despite his previous insistence that it was serious Oscar-winning material. This sudden walk back can best be described as... Tommy was so, he was like, oh, it's a dark comedy. Bollocks. Bollocks. M. Night. Bollocks. <laughs> With his newfound notoriety, Tommy then burned through a number of different projects with various levels of success, like the short-lived Hulu sitcom The Neighbors and an even shorter-lived web show, as well as appearances in films like Samurai Cop 2, which is awful, do not watch it. However, with the success of 2017's The Disaster Artist based on Greg's book, the room reached even bigger levels of infamy and went on to theatrical tours across the globe, often selling out to tuxedo-clad football-tossing fans. With COVID hamstringing much of the movie industry, Tommy's next big project, Big Shark, which was teased in 2019, was then delayed to a nebulous 2021, so fingers crossed on that. While Greg Sestero did very well getting the disaster artist adapted to film, eagle-eyed viewers might have spotted him in a small role in the recent The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. I know I did. There's still a few mysterious mysteries begging to be solved. Along with his pre-The Room fortune, many have speculated over Tommy's roots. And while he maintains he is from Louisiana, that's something that literally everyone still scoffs at. The documentary, Room Full of Spoons, puts forward the theory that he is actually from Poznan, Poland, but this has never been confirmed or denied by Tommy himself. However, one funny dead giveaway is... Which is a specific Polish slang for mimicking a chicken. The room was deathly close to being one of those thousands of obscure, independently made films destined for the dustbin of history, but through luck, fate, or whatever you want to call it, was able to capture the imaginations of fans the world over. This is, of course, despite all that it had going against it. Its conception, its filming, its marketing, just everything about it. I, I shouldn't even be discussing it right now. but. I think Tommy said it best in a 2014 interview. Screening the room midnight eliminated crime in America. Look at how many young people. You've been young. I mean, we still young, whatever. Going to the street, you know, walking out on the street, nothing to do. Go see the room, have fun. Let's assume you don't see the room. You don't have the room. You walk out on the street, grab the rock, and by accident, you hit somebody, you know? Accident happened. Get them arrested, go to jail, whatever. Instead, you see see the room, so high probability crime, high probability, you know what I'm saying. Oh, I totally get what you're saying, Tom. I think, I think everyone here does. 
If you know of any other fantabulous film failures, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or drive your flying vampire car over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss to nominate what you'd like to see next. See you next time, and thanks for watching. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye.